Shalom and Haksameak as we enter into the days of uh, the last of the counting of the Omer, depending on how you are counting it, uh, for the time of Shavuot, or has been called in the church for many years, Pentecost. Now, isn't it kind of amazing how, uh, you know, of course the festivals are done away with, except for that one of Shavuot, the giving of the Spirit in uh, in the book of Acts chapter 2, oh, I remember the days in the Assembly of God church that I was at, Pastor Jim Brankel, and this was the, this was the week he lived for. And I, I never had to ask what message it was going to be. It was going to be Acts chapter, it was called the 2 by 4 message, Acts chapter 2 verse 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, and of course this is uh, later on known as the, the birth of the church and, and uh, all of these things. And it's amazing how that used to make sense. But now understanding that uh, this is all about Israel. And this was about uh, the, the spirit being given. And after the, the, the resurrection of Messiah, um, I don't understand the timing of everything and, and why the, the 6,000 year time period and, and Messiah being coming into this on the 4,000 year time period, the same as the light came into the heavenly bodies that were created on the fourth day. Uh, that you know, that's that's all up to him, and the mysteries one day will be revealed to us. But um, it is a, it should be a special time for all of us, a time of seeking him. I'll I'll say more about that probably just a little while. But this is also Father's Day, and as we it, it's for the, my counting is that day fifty would be on Sunday, which is also Father's Day. So as we seek to honor our uh, earthly fathers, may we also honor our heavenly father. It is, uh, I look back once again to uh, my, uh, Kathy and I, our history. It was 1995, Father's Day 1995, in which the Brownsville Revival broke out. I will be sending a, an email to a good friend of mine who was part of that revival, just wishing him a happy Father's Day as um, it was uh, very instrumental in my life and uh, many other people's lives. Was everything that was there, was there problems? Yes, of course, because there's people. But let's, uh, let's not get our eyes on all the problems, okay? We look to this week's Torah portion, Nassau. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's funny, it's whatever. Uh, this has been a week in which we have celebrated the release, uh, well, no, not the release, but the rescue. Yeah, the, the media wanted to say release, it was the rescue. And it cost a, an IDF, a uh, border security guard, uh, it cost him his life. Um, it, it's a miracle that there were not others. And I know some of the units that were involved in this. It's a miracle that there were not others that were killed in the midst of the, the, the freeing of these four uh, hostages. May there be many more that find freedom very, very soon. Uh, it's the, the war continues uh, just online with Hanok. You know, this, this war should have been over uh, many, many months ago. But the intervention, the meddling, of the United Nations, the United States, and others, Europe in this, has caused this war to go on farther than it should. These hostages should have been rescued uh, quite some time ago. But you know, in, in the, the process of history, uh, you know, you guys know that I, I love to follow the Torah portions and what's happening. And uh, for this week, it was like the father stepped in to our time and said, by the way, just in case you're wondering if I am still involved, well, I am, for Nassau is a Nun, a Sheen, and an Aleph. Those three letters are the first three letters of all four of those hostages that were freed as they were lifted up from captivity and are now uh, there with their families. Of course, one of the, uh, the hostages their father died just hours prior to being uh, being freed. Um, 
in the midst of that, it is Israel is a dichotomy of emotion to me. Um, these these months have, have been very very difficult. As one day there's a great victory, and the next day there is the the killing. The um, uh, this morning I woke up and saw that four other soldiers from the Gavati Brigade. Uh, one that I've I've uh, been involved in in some of that a, por- a portion of that brigade, in uh, in various ways. But four soldiers from the Gavati Brigade were were killed. The fighting continues. Uh, it's not it's not going to slack off. It is going to continue on, and um, we just continue to pray for complete victory. Uh, may the greater Son of David come into this situation. Now, the, the, the Torah portion of Nassau, Yudhei Vavhe spoke to Moshe, take a census of the descendants of Gershon, also by clans and families. And this goes along with other places of taking a census. Now, I was just reading through, I just finished actually the, uh, the, book of, the books of uh, Judges. And also of Samuel. And it speaks of a time in which David also took a census. Now, so, so why is it that the kings were told to not take a census of the people? And in fact, David, when we look at it, it appears that the taking of a census was actually a greater sin than Bathsheba, as it is mentioned um, in, uh, in some of the books of history. Uh, this is the one that he paid dearly for. I, I, uh, both of them he did. But this sin seems to be uh, of greater, uh, greater value. Uh, I guess that's a, that's a d- bad word, but I can't think of a better one right now. But it's, it's a worse sin than even Bathsheba. Why? Because David was counting the people of Israel and the people of of Judea in order to figure out who was stronger so that they could do battle between each other. I think you can tell why this would be a grievous sin. But here is a different way of counting. It's, it's a different, the, the difference is that the word is lift up and it is also, uh, the, it can be translated to bear up or to carry. So in order to understand this word a little bit better, it is in uh, Genesis chapter, the, the first time it's used, is Genesis chapter 4, verse 13. And it is the words of, um, let's see, Genesis, no, I'm still in there's Exodus right there. Let's go back to Genesis. That's before Exodus. It's always great when I just turn to it and it's right there and I look like I know what I'm doing. But then there's other times like this that it takes me seeming forever to get there. So in Genesis chapter 4, verse 13, is the account of Cain and Abel. It is the words of Cain when he said that this, uh, that this burden is too much for me to bear, to lift up, to carry. But then the second time that it is used is over in Genesis chapter 7, verse 17. I'm just going to go ahead and quote it, so I don't have to turn there. But in Genesis chapter 7, 7 verse 17, it says that the water lifted up the ark. It was bearing the ark. So what is this telling us? In these two things, it was not just about taking a census so that we would have the names and the, uh, the, the, of the, the families and the tribes and the people that are there for record, but it, it was to lift them up. The people of Israel were to look at the tribes of Gershon and, and the various others that are mentioned here, and they were to lift them up because of the work that they were doing. So I question here in the, in, with this. 
how are we doing at lifting people up? People that are around us. I'm not just talking about those in ministry. This would be, I could, I could do a little self-serving message here. I'm not going to do that. But the question in our day is, uh, is are we lifting people up into the calling that God has for their lives? Or tearing them down? I can tell you as somebody that's been in ministry for well over 30 years now that um, ministry is very similar to the proverbial pot of crabs. If uh, and I know this is, this is not a real kosher <laughs> illustration here, but if you've ever been as, as I was in North Florida, we would go out and me and my granddad would actually, uh, from time to time, would go get blue crabs. And to get a, to, to crab, you take a, just a piece of, a long piece of twine, and you tie a chicken leg or something onto it. You throw it out into the water right there on the bay or, or wherever you're at in the, the shallow waters, and you draw it in. Well, if, uh, if you're, you know, if you do it, if you're in a good spot, Every time you draw that thing in, you're going to have a crab. And there's no hook. There, you don't have to have one because that crab will hold on to that drumstick or whatever it is that you threw out there until you bring him in, you grab the back of him, and you throw it into a pot. You don't have to put a lid on the pot. Even though you're putting crabs in, and eventually, if the crabs thought about it, they could actually all be free because the one at the top could reach down and help the ones below and they could form a little crab train and they could or crab chain or train or whatever you want to call it and all of them could get out. But instead, what do the crabs do? The one that's trying to get out, the ones below will pull them back down. What are we doing in life? Are we helping people into the purpose of their lives or bringing them down. It is unfortunate that still to this day, and I see this in, in Christianity, I see this in Judaism, I see this in, in Messianic circles, Hebrew roots, whatever you want. It, it is a society thing because it is a human thing. Uh, racism, uh, all... Yeah, society in general, as my mind is spinning around about this, is not about lifting people up. It is about tearing people down. And you and I should be making a decision regarding how we treat other people. I know we're going to, I, I fail at that. All of us do. But it should be our desire that we're always seeking to build people up and lift them up, even to the point that they are, you know, this is why I call the youth, young adults, the rising generation. Because it is my involvement that I try to have in their lives to raise them up into the purposes that the Father has called them for. Now, moving on, I got a couple of kind of a interesting twist here. It's, it's a really sharp curve. In chapter 5, order the people of Israel to expel from the camp anyone with zarat or leprosy, anyone with a discharge or whatever is unclean because of touching a corpse. So send out the uncleanliness of the camp. Uh, we could go over to the book of Corinthians, in which Shaul, Paul, speaks regarding the people that are there. They are, and we could go to Revelation. I know that you have these people in your midst, and you are not expelling them. Well, we just need to love everybody. Well, love is calling a person out for what they're doing. 
I was uh, talking to a friend of mine the other day who was, uh, this was, um, I won't give details at all, but was expressing the churches even in our area that they know of and how much sin is tolerated within the walls of those buildings. Uh, I've seen this, you've seen this. There comes a time, folks, that we cannot condone uncleanliness within though the, the, the people that we have as part of our congregations. When you find out that someone is in sin, they must be confronted. And if they refuse to repent for that, and I'll get to that in just a moment, if they refuse to, then they are to be expelled Anyone that is living in blatant sin, and I understand the difference between, yes, we have a fallen nature, and we're all going, we all walk into our buildings, into wherever you are, and we, we have faults, we have issues that we deal with, but there is a difference between dealing with the, 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 the personality quirks that we have and, and things like that and blatant sin. So if someone is in our midst and they are unrepentant, they must be brought to a place of disciplinary action, which is to expel them from the camp. We should not be tolerating uncleanliness within our camp. Now, the other side of that is in Galatians, of all places that I'm going. Uh, Galatians, and I actually can turn there because I put a marker in my Bible, so that's why I did it so fast. But in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers, suppose someone is caught doing something wrong. You, you who have the Spirit should set him right, but in the spirit of humility, keeping an eye on yourselves so that you will not be tempted also. We, Kathy and I spent time in the Assembly of God Church. Now, it was interesting enough that, that we were in a Nazarene church uh, we had been, as, as I grew up, you know, uh, kind of like those at Ephesus, not knowing if there be such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And in those early days, began to watch a number of Pentecostal preachers on television that were explaining the working of the Holy Spirit. Interesting enough that this is on during the time of Shavuot that I'm talking about this. Well, one thing led to another, and um, we decided it was time, well, it was kind of decided for us, in a way, but uh, we decided that we were going to go from the Nazarene Church, great group of people, loved them dearly, but because of the experience that had happened in our lives, it was appropriate for us to, res now that I look back at it, respect the boundaries of that denomination and move on to one whose boundaries were more in line with our experience. hope I said that very politically correct. Now, with that, um, this was in the days of Jim Baker, Jimmy Swagger, various others. And um, as seems like the father kind of is, is uses a sense of, of humor at times, I guess I could call it that. And when we announced that we were leaving the Nazarene church because of being filled with the Spirit and embracing the gifts of the Spirit, it was during the same weeks as the Jimmy Swagger thing back in the mid-1980s. Um, <laughs> well... You can imagine, you know, what, the, what it was that people were saying to us about this. 
Uh, but we knew what we had to do. Well, someone that I was talking to said, you know, and this is where I, I really came, I found this, this scripture here of, if you see someone that is overtaken with a sin, Restore them in the spirit of meekness, lest you also be tempted. And there were those, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm using it as an illustration, that when Jim Baker, Jim and Tammy Baker, went through issues in the 80s, that Jimmy Swagger came out and publicly uh, lambasted them. And some believed, and I, I can't prove this or not, but it is because of that that Jimmy Swaggart had his own issues. So understand that when someone is called, is when we have to, I'm tying this all together, when a time comes that we confront someone and in the confrontation they refuse repentance, but yet choose to stay in their sin, we should seek restoration. But that restoration, and that restoration be, should be on, in humility on our part. We should not seek condemnation regarding them. For if we seek condemnation, if we take joy in them being expelled and living in their sin in a warped sense of, uh, in, a, in a warped way, it is an open door for us to also be tempted in something. So l let me put it a different way and drive this a little closer to home. Uh, let's say that you have, you and, or I have something in our lives that we consistently deal with. It just seems like this will not go away. Um, I, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go into any, anything of, of, you know, calling something out, but we all know those things that kind of, to use a crazy word here, haunt us. Things that we just don't seem to be able to get over. Is it possible that instead of calling it a generational curse or, you know, something, uh, something that can always be blamed on somebody else, maybe... Maybe the reason we're dealing with something and unable to find a place of freedom from that something is because of a judgmental attitude towards somebody else regarding the same issue? I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'm crazy. But maybe it's something that we should be seeking the Father is... M -M because of something that, uh, an attitude that I had towards someone, uh, a word spoken to someone, that that has brought a curse into our own lives to where we're not able to find a place of freedom. Now, hope, I hope that made some sense. Uh, I'm not sure if it, if it came out as good as I wanted it to. So I'm going to move on. In uh, verse 6, Tell the people of Israel, when a man or woman commits any kind of sin against another person and thus break faith, breaks faith with Adonai, he incurs guilt, incurs guilt. He must confess the sin which he has committed and he must take full restitution for his guilt, add 20% and give it to the victim of his sin. Oh, wow, there's a lot going on right here. He must confess. Now, I've talked about this numerous times. Uh, someone comes to you and says, forgive me. Okay. The next thing should be, for what? What am I forgiving you for? Now, it, that's not that we're trying to be mean to the person. That, that's not that we're trying to hold our forgiveness back from them. But they need to 
they need to proclaim what it is that they are asking forgiveness about. We, we, do, we should do the same thing. You know, I mean, look at this. It says, breaks faith with yud vave It is one thing for us to say, oh, God, please forgive me. But how about getting specific with him? about uh, why doesn't he know what it is that we did of course he knows but it is part of the freedom it is part of the 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 becoming free from something when we confess it unto him when we confess something to another person if someone wrongs you they should come to you and if you wrong someone else you should go to them and not just some kind of, you know, what we used to call sloppy agape, uh, kind of, you know, please, you know, forgive me because I, I said that, you know, didn't know. It should be a serious conversation. Now, the word there of confess is the word yada. Uh, you, you, might, you might recognize that word means to throw, but it is also translated in many places as praise. So, how can confession, confessing something, and praise be in the same word? Well, it's, it's very simple because when we confess our sin, it is going to bring us back from a place of uncleanliness into a place of cleanliness, and that should bring forth praise in our lives. Now, that same person is told that they are to bring a, given a restitution, uh, a full restitution for the guilt, and add 20% to it. Uh, I, I heard someone say that, uh, you know, if you, if you missed your tithe, that you should, uh, you, you should also, you know, when you, when you came to your senses and, and made up for that tithe, you should, you should add 20%. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I go along with that one. I, I think it's more of, here's my opinion, that when we do something that brings us into an unclean state, it is going to affect other people. If we hold on to it, it can affect in some very grievous and detrimental ways. Understanding that you or I just coming and saying, you know, forgive me of, doing, of saying something bad about you. Okay, I forgive you. And you move on. Well, it's kind of like the old, uh, the old story of the guy that started to gossip against someone else. Eventually, they felt conviction regarding this, came to the person they had gossiped against, uh, and, and asked forgiveness, and the person said, yeah, I forgive you, but I want you to do something. Uh, I want you to take a pillow and go up on the top of that hilltop right there, and I want you to, this is back in the days of feather pillows, okay, I have to, this doesn't work with the, uh, the you know, uh, with Mr. Pillow thing, I don't think, anymore. But back in the days of feather pillows, he said, take this pillow, go up to the top of that mountain, cut the pillow open, and wave it in the wind to where all the, all the feathers, you know, come out of it. The guy does that, goes up the top, comes back down, hands him the, the empty pillowcase, and the person says, now go up and pick up all of the feathers. Well, that's impossible. See, sin has consequences. And we must understand that those consequences, not all of them can you get back into the pillowcase. If a person gossips about someone, there's no way to get those words back. There's no way that anyone can ever go and find every single place 
This is why it's very important for us. Someone comes to us, as, as I think we've probably all experienced through our life, the person that just likes to gossip. Well, that, that's not what they call it. Uh, it's, it's, it's sharing prayer requests. I, I'm not much for the old prayer chain. I, I, I saw prayer chains uh, in, in churches that we were a part of that basically end up being gossip sessions. You know, it's, it's kind of like the, the operator on Andy Griffith that knew everything that was going on in town and could tell you some things that they really shouldn't be telling you, we need to be very careful. When somebody comes and wants to share a prayer request, it might be a good idea to look at the person and say, you know, I really don't want to hear your gossip. Or you look at them and say, you know, uh, Instead of you telling me about this prayer request of, that, you know, that you have regarding somebody else, why don't you and I go over and visit them and pray with them about this? <laughs> I guarantee you that person will never try to share anything with you again. All right, moving on. Again, another hard right turn. Chapter 6, the Nazarite vow. Uh, there's no way that a person today can do a Nazarite vow because there is no temple. But this doesn't mean that we should just kind of look over these words and say, well, this, this doesn't mean anything to me. I do know I had an acquaintance many years ago that did a Nazarite vow in their own way. Uh, eventually, you know, they, they can't follow through with all of it because there's a part of the Nazarite vow that has a sacrifice, and we, you know, we can't do that. But how can we look at this Nazarite vow? Uh, very simple. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you did something special for God? I mean, just kind of out of the blue. It's like, uh, once in a while, I probably should do this more often. But... Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be at uh, the Walmart or Ingalls or something, and I'll bring flowers home for Kathy or, you know, something like that. Uh, she'll do something of, of just, you know, making something special for, for me. Um, you know, just l little things, you know. So when's the last time that you just did something special for him? Well, I guess that you had to, you'd have to ask, well, you know, well, what can I do? I don't know. Why don't you just, how about spend a little time on Shabbat and just think about it? You know, um, this past Shabbat, oh, we, uh, someone in our, our congregation said, uh, yeah, I got a phone call from one of the other people in our congregation, and it was just a, a, a phone call of encouragement. That's like the second or third time that's happened. Maybe doing something for God would be picking up the phone writing an email or a text or something and just, you know, maybe somebody's out there and, and, and right now they're praying, God, I just could use a word of encouragement. And the, the Father is asking you to be the one that gives that. And in, and in doing so, it's kind of a joint effort. You're doing something special for Him that is going to also encourage somebody else. Think about that, okay? Now, chapter 7, hard right turn. Uh, on the day Moshe finished putting up the tabernacle. Wait a minute. Moshe did the whole thing. Well, the way that I read it, uh, wait a minute, before I get there, I just went right through the erotic blessing. Yeah, how did I do that? Evereka Kadonai Ishmareka. Ya'er Adonai Panavi Leka Vikoneka. I want to read to you, as I've, I think I do this every year, uh, but I'm going to definitely do it this year, the translation of these words by Jeff Binner, ancienthebrew.com, uh, I think is his, his website. If you put in Jeff Binner, you'll be able to find this. But I think that Jeff probably did the, the best job that I've ever seen anyone do regarding these beautiful words. 
because the ironic blessing, it says, this is the way you were to put my name on the people of Israel. Now, I guess there would be people that would, would then argue about, well, what name is he putting? Is it yud heh Is it this pronunciation? No, it's not about the pronunciation. The, the word name, Shem, is about his breath and his authority. And that's why I, we, in the, the early days of, of join to Hashem, and people still question, why did I use Hashem instead of others? Because I love that, that, that terminology of Shem, that Hebrew word for name, because it brings out so much. It means uh, it's about his breath, his authority. So this is how you, the priests were to place the breath and authority of the Almighty upon the people of Israel, therefore empowering them to bring forth his kingdom upon this earth as they waited for his kingdom to come to this earth. And that is our job. That yes, we are waiting for his kingdom to come, but in the waiting for it to be established, we should be doing that which we can to establish it. Hope that, again, makes sense. In these words of the ironic blessing, are, it is said that everything that is needed in your life is within these words. Uh, during the time of Rosh Kodesh, the new moon, it is traditional, uh, our tradition, mine and Kathy's, that I, every month, pray that the Father would give unto us and our family blessing, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially, and in that order. Because that order is specific. You could have all of the money, you know, Elon Musk decides that he wants to will all of his money to you, or, or to, to give it all away before he dies. Uh, if, you do, if you have all the money of Elon Musk or, or any of these other people, but you do not have your health physically, then it means nothing. You just have a bank account that you can do nothing with. If you have your physical health, but you're an emotional wreck, you're in a, a sane asylum. Uh, you know, my mother went through dementia. I've gone through this with many other people. You can have a lot of money in the bank, be physically healthy, but not have your emotional capabilities, and it mean nothing. And on top of all of that is spiritual. If your life is a spiritual train wreck, then it does nothing else really matters in life because you have no purpose of getting up in the morning i would um, i would urge you to go back to uh last week uh, myself and alex styles did a life on purpose and he talks about as his life as a uh, uh in the icu uh, I, I call him. I, it's now stuck. He's uh, he's a he's a brain he, he's a brain nurse, uh, neurosurgery nurse, and so he talks about the people that he deals with in that ICU unit that are there because of drug use, and he talks about the question that people should you know people normally ask well why are they doing drugs when in actuality the it should be why are you not doing drugs in the life that we, you know the, the society we live in today as an escape because those of us who have hope because of our destination and the one that we believe is our redeemer uh you know if it wasn't for him i don't know why somebody goes through this life without uh trying to escape this life in some way so in these words is everything that we need. And I want to read it to you from, um, got a little bit of a rabbit trail there. Here's, here's how Jeff Binner translated these words. 
He who exists will kneel before you presenting gifts and will guard you with the hedge of protection. He who exists will illuminate the wholeness of his being toward you, bringing order, and he will beautify you. He who exists will lift up his wholeness of his being and look upon you, and he will see you, put you in, put in place all you need to be whole and complete. Sorry, my picture that I took of it doesn't have that last word. So, he who exists will lift up his wholeness of his be, of being and look upon you, and he will put you in place, put in place all you need to be whole and complete. He, the, uh, I guess... What, struck, what strikes me every time I read this is he who exists will kneel before you. It's a story I use many times of uh, when I used to travel a lot having young children. And they all would always, you know, they'd greet me at the door, what would you bring me? And I'd say, hello. And they oh, hello, what would you bring me? And I would always, you know, when they were young, I would never just hand it to, I wouldn't hand it to them. I wouldn't say never, but I would try not to just hand it down from my level to theirs, but would kneel before them and hand it to them. Uh, I do that today with our grandchildren, with other children, uh, to, to be at their level. And so what we can see in this is the wonderful message that the Father has come to our level in order to deal with us, to work with us, to help us, to present to us the things that we need to go to 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 make a difference in this life, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. So Moshe in chapter seven, uh, it says Moshe erected the tabernacle, but it wasn't Moshe. He gets the credit for it. It's kind of like a contractor that in the end has you know built by so and so, but all that contractor did was sub the whole thing out. Um, didn't pick up a hammer didn't pick up a saw, didn't do anything of, didn't pick up a two by four even, you know, didn't do anything of physical labor here, but their name was on it and got credit for it. And Moshe gets credit and Moshe deserves credit because he was kind of the, the, the superintendent. He was the one, I mean, in the end, the father gets, we had when I worked with a, a contractor up in Alaska as a listing agent, uh, I don't remember Larry ever picking up anything more than a, a, a piece of, of paper and a pencil. And in those days, this is how we built houses. He would, he would get a, a lot of times it was on a napkin at the North Slope restaurant in Eagle River, Alaska, or it was on a, you know, the back of a paper bag or something. And uh, he would pencil that out of what he wanted and he'd hand it to Dick, uh, to Dick Griggs and Dick was the superintendent, but Dick's name was never anywhere. Nobody knew him. They all knew Larry because his name was on the, the sign out front. And Moshe, in a way, was just the same way. It's, it's really the Father's house. The tabernacle is the Father's house. Moshe is the one that is doing the work. No, no, no. Moshe is the one that is overseeing the work. And therefore, he got credit for, but it is all the people coming together. Are we willing to come together for a purpose? Uh, to, to, to put in our, our physical labor, our finances, all of those things, but never get credit? I don't have to ask that question of many of those of you that are, that are watching me. As you understand that concept, sorry, you understand that concept. I got my phone here in front of me, and it, it, I, I, I didn't. I, I need to see. I needed to see that. And I just ended up having um, an email come in, and it was somebody that I just looked down, and I know that it's an amount that's going to Israel. Um, 
can't give their name on on this uh, on this broadcast, nor would they want me to. Um, I, I've never mentioned their name in Israel, nor do they care. And that's kind of like a lot of you that are out there that have given, especially during this time since October seventh. Uh, so much has been done through these months. And nobody has given you credit. But in the end, the Father has seen every single check, PayPal, cash donate, whatever has been given. And those things are in your account. It's, it's kind of like, and I'm, I'm actually this week at, uh, at, at Life Assembly, I'm actually doing the Tabernacle Experience and I'll talk about this of uh, maybe a young couple that's out there and they're, uh, they're, they're out for a walk and they look up and see a little piece of leather in the, the roof, the, the top covering of the tabernacle that they donated. And they can look at their child and, and say, you know, we were the ones that donated that. In the kingdom, will you and I, what will we have that we can point to significant insignificant in our view what will we be able to point to and say that is what we brought this that's not that's not prideful folks that's not some kind of arrogance that's that's just being part of it that we we desire that it doesn't matter if if messiah gets the credit because that's where the credit is due. But I want to have my piece of leather in the kingdom for his glory and honor. Now with that, a couple minutes, Shavuot. Shavuot is given on Mount Sinai, not, in, not, at, not on Mount Zion, not in, on Mount Hermon. Not on Mount Tabor. It's given in, in it's, it's given in exile. It's given to a people that are on their way back, but it's given outside of the land. Why? If there's there's teaching that, that and I agree with this, that if they had given if the Torah had been given in Israel, then some would have said, Well, it's just for Israel. Now we see in Isaiah chapter two the Torah will go forth from Jerusalem. Because the Torah, the instructions are for all of, all of the world, but it will be centered out of Israel one day, and may that be soon, and in our day. We celebrate this time on Shavuot, but it's not, we're not told that it's Shavuot. We're not told that it's, Pente it's Pentecost. We're not told it's the 50th day. Why? Because if it was given on the 50th day, on Shavuot, and we were told that, then there would maybe be some that said, well, it's for this day. No, it is for eternity, for yesterday, today, and forever, as the CD, the message that I just did, uh, Unashamed Plug, that's available on my website. But then we look at Acts chapter 2, and um, Acts chapter 2 is when Yah invades your schedule. I challenge you to go back and read Acts chapter 2, I read the book of Acts, but Acts chapter 2 is they were, they didn't know what to expect. And all of a sudden, he invaded their schedule. May that happen more often in our own lives. You know, when you read the, the verses, it says, that there were some that were, uh, they were amazed, there were some that were perplexed or confused, and there were some that made fun of them. Guys, the, um, the, 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 the walk that, we've, that, has been, that we have said yes to, I guess is the best way to put it, the walk that we have said yes to, there are a lot of people that are amazed at it. <laughs> there are a lot of people that are confused and, and perplexed over it. And there are some that make fun of you. Well... In the end, embrace your walk, because you're walking unto him and not unto them. Shabbat Shalom, Shavuotov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem, God willing. 
See you again next week. Until then, be strong. Yivarech Adonai V'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai panav elecha V'yichunecha Yisa Adonai Sam Lecha Shalom